Hello, my name is Andrew Misner. I am the editor of Commercial Dispute Resolution. I am delighted to welcome you to this CDR Essential Intelligence webinar on the challenges and solutions of Belt and Road disputes. Apologies for the slight delay. As we've all learned by now, the vicissitudes of Zoom are, are never quite straightforward, but I'm delighted to welcome you to this session. When it comes to international dispute resolution, few sectors generate as much big ticket work as infrastructure. And when it comes to infrastructure projects, none are bigger than China's Belt and Road Initiative. Initially unveiled in 2013, the initiative is vast in scale and finance, but also hard to define with no definitive list of projects. As such, how disputes will be handled for, men, for these many high value operations is an issue of critical important, commercial and even geopolitical importance. This was the topic of our essential intelligence book on the Belt and Road Initiative, the first edition of which was published in September 2021. It is also a question that is occupying some of the world's finest legal minds, and we are lucky to be joined by such a panel of experts today. First, two of the contributing editors of that book. Dr. Colin Ong QC is Senior Partner at Brunei's Dr. Colin Ong Legal Services, Counsel at Singapore's Eldon Law, and also practices at London's 36 Stone Chambers. He has appeared as counsel and arbitrator in a wide range of commercial and construction arbitrations across Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and the UK. Crucially for today, he is also a member of the International Commercial Expert Committee, the body which provides interpretation and mediation for the Chinese International Commercial Court. Stephen Yagish QC is Global Chair of the International Arbitration Practice at Quinn Emanuel Urquhart & Sullivan. Based in London, he has a strong background in international commercial and investment treaty arbitration, both ad hoc and at major institutions, acting both for and against sovereign states. Colin and Stephen are joined by three speakers who bring an institutional perspective from Asia. Dr. Fu Yong Cheng is the Deputy Secretary General of the Beijing Arbitration Commission and Beijing International Arbitration Center. A qualified lawyer in China, he is also a widely published author on dispute resolution matters. Uh, Sarah Grimmer, who is not with us at the moment, but I hope will be able to join us shortly, is the Secretary General of the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center and former legal counsel with the Permanent Court of Arbitration and a former member of the Secretariat at the ICC International Court of Arbitration. That gives her first-hand knowledge of the administration of investor state and commercial arbitrations. Prior to that, she was in private practice with Shearman and Sterling and has worked in New Zealand and France. Talking of the ICC, we are also joined by Hazel Tang, counsel in charge of the ICC case management office in Singapore. A former director of the Singapore International Mediation Center, Hazel has worked as arbitrator, mediator, and in private practice with Raja and Tan in Singapore and China across construction and infrastructure disputes. Having outlined the speaker's credentials, you'll no, no, no doubt be anticipating their insights. So I will now hand to Colin Ong to lead today's discussion. Over to you, Colin. Thank you very much, Andrew, for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon, good morning and good evening to all of you, wherever you may be. It is my pleasure and privilege to be your uh, moderator for this webinar today. I thank CDR for putting this event together and also the Beijing Arbitration Commission, HIIC and ICC uh, for supporting the event. Uh, so we are very lucky today uh, to have the administrative heads of all the uh, most important um, arbitral institutions uh, which focus on Belt and Road Initiative disputes. And uh, because we have so many um, of the um, heads here with us today, which is unprecedented, I don't think um, we uh, have come across some sessions where you have all of them uh, seated at the same table or rather on the same virtual platform now. Um, we shall uh, play this uh, webinar um, in a slightly different way. Uh, we'll try to have a more interactive mode and uh, try to have a, a quite, quite a bit more uh, time uh, for, for you, the registrants, um, to join in and share your views and ask questions. So I shall provide a brief summation of the salient points of each topic before 
I invite the speakers uh, to deal with uh, what they view are the challenges and opportunities of each of the um, uh, subject matter um, in each topic. So they will pre present short viewpoints and they will exchange views amongst themselves. And at the end of the uh, uh, discussion on the last topic, we shall open up to the, to the floor to all of you. Please put your questions in and do start thinking of your questions because we do want to have an interactive session. Um, uh, and, and, and do please uh, direct your question towards any specific speaker uh, whom you want to deal with the question, uh, because if there's none, I'll have to find them, um, I'll have to think about which speaker to direct the same to. So without much further ado, um, let's move into the first topic of the day, uh, which lays the groundwork for the other topics to, to follow. So our in-person um, hearings preferred for Belt and Road disputes. And there are two different issues in this first topic. Firstly, the issue of in-person hearings and obviously uh, the definition of BRI disputes. Despite initial resistance from arbitrators and counsel at the start of the COVID uh, pandemic, it has now become the case uh, over the last two years that virtual hearings and hybrid hearings are now gradually uh, overcoming uh, uh, any initial resistance, and it's now the de facto uh, modus operandi uh, to run um, oral oral arguments. Um, um, and uh, most countries are still in travel lockdown. But we see uh, the impact of Omicron uh, peaking, and now slowly uh, countries are beginning to overcome Omicron. We are seeing the easing of travel lockdowns and more vaccinated travel lanes or green lanes, whatever you call it. But it's indeed good news because soon we should be back to uh, what it what used to be two and a half years ago. The question that both uh, practitioners and arbitration centers are faced with now is whether uh, in-person physical hearings will begin to displace virtual hearings uh, and whether uh, in-person hearings will regain its position as a default mode uh, of conducting ar ar oral arbitrations in the post-COVID world. And obviously the second uh, part of the uh, uh, first topic is to deal with the definition of what is a BRI dispute. So there's much debate as to what constitutes BRI projects. Different individuals and organizations have very different views uh, as to the precise meaning of a BRI project. The widely accepted view is that any disputes which arise from a Chinese funded project in any Belt and Road country uh, between a Chinese enterprise and a local counterparty will be likely to be deemed to be uh, a BRI project and a BRI dispute if one happens. And if that, Chinese enterprise happens to be a Chinese state-owned enterprise, then there is no doubt that it is a BRI dispute. So um, we, um, we now uh, will move into the topic. And I think the first person uh, who should deal with these issues is none other than my colleague, Stephen Yagush. So Stephen, uh, being the global head of a major dispute firm, uh, do tell us and share with us your views on what do you think about um, in-person hearings coming back and whether uh, there are uh, more opportunities uh, to see uh, more of this happening. Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Colin. Um, and uh, uh, can I join you in thanking uh, those who are presenting today uh, and also those who are participating. Uh, um, um, Belt and Road Disputes initiative. The initiative disputes are obviously very important and they're going to increase in number over time. Uh, that much is, uh, is obvious. Um, I do commend to you the CDR publication, which has a tremendous number of highly valuable contributions from distinguished authors and uh, legal practitioners around the world 
dealing with all sorts of issues that might arise in Belt and Road um, initiative disputes. As to the question about personal in-person hearings, um, it's very trendy to be saying that um, uh, we have been saved by technology. Uh, the fog has been lifted from our eyes. We can now conduct hearings virtually. There's no need for the travel expense and the sometimes uh, inevitable delay that's required to organize an in-person hearing. It's obviously easier to get people together when we don't have to arrange long distance travel and accommodation and the like. Um, but I think I speak for a large number of practitioners, although probably not everyone, when I say that there's nothing nearly as satisfying uh, as conducting a hearing in person. Um, many feel that a lot is lost in terms of being able to read the room, the mood in the room, um, reading the arbitrators, opposing counsel, um, seeing your op opponent clients in the room and witnesses and experts. There is no substitute in my view for that in-person experience. Yes, we have been able to continue with the administration of justice via electronic means. And for the most part, it has been very effective. But one argument that's often put forward for retaining the use of electronic hearings as opposed to in-person hearings is the time and cost saving. And with the greatest of respect, um, for substantial disputes, and many of the Belt and Road Initiative disputes, uh, because we're dealing with some of the world's largest projects, are likely to be very substantial disputes. With respect to those, the additional cost actually of travel and accommodation is at the margins of relevance, in my view, having regard to the overall costs of um, arbitration proceedings. So I don't think that argument holds up as a basis for us to continue with hearings online. I think most practitioners and arbitrators are looking forward to getting back to our old ways of having people together in discussing and engaging issues in person. I also think as counsel, uh, it's far more valuable to be taking instructions from clients in real time, to be discussing issues as they arise in real time with your um, team members. Uh, I don't think that that can be adequately replaced in the long term by uh, electronic hearings. So, so in answer to your question, yes, it works. Do we need it for all hearings? Do we need it for case management conferences and the like? Well, in some cases, yes. And if, for example, it's not a great hardship for parties to travel, for example, let's say it's uh, a European arbitration with counsel and, and clients and arbitrators um, who might have a short travel um, journey to London or Paris or Geneva or whatever it is, then I can see that CMCs will start to um, continue in person as well. But CMCs are less important, obviously, than full hearings on the merits. So that's where I see it going. I hope, I hope we see a reversion to um, um, in-person hearings or even um, hybrid hearings. Um, not everyone will be able to travel, certainly for a while because of ongoing COVID restrictions and the like. But that's, that's where I see the, the direction of traffic um, um, headed. And I'd be grateful and interested to hear the views uh, of my co-panelists. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, personally, I agree with you. I think um, hybrid hear hearings um, are now veering more towards uh, more in person and less virtual, uh, whereas previously uh, only perhaps one arbitrator and perhaps uh, one set of councils from the team and not even the complete complement of, of, of council were able yeah. to get together. And um, I, 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 I would uh, tend to agree with you. And I think there's more scope for settlements, et cetera. But let's discuss this at the end uh, after we've finished um, uh, with um, our different um, uh, topics. Uh, can I ask, uh, invite uh, Fu Yong uh, to share with us whether 
uh, there are um, real cost savings to holding virtual hearings instead of in-person hearings, and whether the number of cases uh, have gone up um, uh, for virtual hearings and hybrid hearings. Um, over to you, Fu Yong. Thank you, Colin. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be a member of this panel. Uh, based on the uh, BAC's experience, I would say the answer is yes. Uh, the virtual hearing, I would save the cost. Uh, you know, uh, in 2021, BAC newly accept uh, 249 uh, international cases and uh, 7,488 uh, domestic cases. And there were uh, 32 international cases in 366 domestic cases using uh, virtual hearings. So, you know, China is a big country so, and over 70% of the case at BAC are involving uh, parties from outside of Beijing. So the virtual hearing would be very helpful even for uh, domestic cases, uh, let alone the international uh, uh, cases. And you know, for in China, the, the core system uh, promote the virtual hearing uh, 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 strongly. So I feel even uh, the end of the COVID-19, uh, the virtual hearing uh, still will be uh, strongly recommend in uh, also, also broadly used uh, among uh, Chinese uh, disputing parties. Back to you, uh, Colin. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, what about Hazel? Um, what do you see um, on the same point? Um, how, how do you see it have, uh, developing uh, with ICC uh, Singapore and ICC Asia generally? Well, I certainly echo Fu Yong's point that, that virtual hearings do result in actual cost savings because a lot of times the arbitrator's biggest ticket expenses are the travel expenditure. And this is not just flights and accommodation, but also the per diem. Um, so with the, the rise of virtual hearings in the past few years, we have seen a drop in the expenses claimed by tribunal. But I also think that Stephen and yourself is certainly right that, that virtual hearings may not be suitable for every case, especially complex arbitrations such as those involved in the BRI dispute. But one thing that I, I foresee will happen even after the pandemic is that virtual hearings or, or rather physical hearings will no longer just be the default. I think the mode of hearing, whether it's virtual, in person or hybrid, which we are starting to see more and more these days, will be a live discussion in any arbitration going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Hazel. Uh, perhaps I could also uh, invite Sarah to uh, share with us uh, uh, what do you think of the effectiveness of virtual hearings uh, compared to in-person hearings when dealing with BRI infrastructure projects? Thank you, Colin, and thank you everyone uh, for your patience in my joining. Um, let me go straight to the topic. Uh, I think that in terms of BRI disputes, because they're, they are such a vast range, uh, virtual hearings can be highly effective, uh, but they can also have challenges. So for example, when we're dealing with uh, uh, complex construction hearings, which typically are long, require heavy document presentations, sometimes quite technical documents, there may be joint fact or expert witnessing can, that can add a layer of complexity. I think that when hearings are like that, there is still a preference really to have that be an in-person situation. Although over the pandemic, we can see that you can conduct those kinds of hearings virtually and it does work well. But I think that with those kinds of hearings, I think that that will probably, when the pandem pandemic lightens up for everybody, um, there will still be that preference. But as Hazel's just said, we've seen that so much can be done virtually and that will change the, the, the pendulum will swing back, but much more on the virtual side. And, um... Sarah, what do you think of uh, cross-examination uh, in online hearings? How effective do you think they are when compared to in-person hearings? 
Well, I think that council have come at it with a diff some different views. Some council think that, you know, when it's online, you, you can't sense the tone of the room. You can't really see what impact is being made on the tribunal. And maybe you can't assess the credibility of a witness as well as you could in person. But then others say that because of the amplified screen of the witness, actually you can see their face so much more and there's much more focus on that. So I think that it can go both ways and maybe it depends on the advocate and maybe it depends on the witness and it may also depend on what language you're operating in if it's a native language or if you're going through simultaneous interpretation i also think that there have been concerns about the integrity of witness uh, evidence are they alone in the room do they have devices what's going on and you can't always be sure but i think that you know we've found ways around those concerns in terms of having 360 degree reviews of the room in question or having an invigilator with the witness at hand. And we've, at HKIC, we've dealt with uh, about 220 partially or fully virtual hearings over the last two years. And we've seen that those kinds of concerns can be dealt with in, in pragmatic ways. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll definitely have more discussions on this after uh, the end of the uh, discussions on the other topics. Um, perhaps Hazel, um, what do you think of issues of um, parties agreeing uh, to seats, let's say uh, in Singapore where you are, I see Singapore, and um, how do they deal, how do you as a centre deal with a situation where let's say only one arbitrator uh, is situated outside um, Singapore or the Asian time zone, um, but the other players are um, in Asia. How, how does the ICC uh, go about it when um, perhaps selecting uh, arbitrators in a default position, either sole arbitrator or presiding arbitrator? How would you do it? It is interesting um, because most of the time we see that, that uh, parties try to hold a physical hearing in the place of arbitration. So the place of arbitration or what some people know as the seat of arbitration is certainly an important factor that court always takes into consideration when it comes to confirming or appointing arbitrators. Uh, the prospective arbitrators, nationality, residence, and the relationship to the countries from which the parties are in, all these are taken into consideration when it comes to choosing the right arbitrator for the particular case. However, the, with the increasing use of virtual hearings, this assumption of a physical hearing is out the window. Um, time zone becomes a real issue. And I think that, that's one of, one of the considerations that's been uh, live to parties and arbitrators. Um, one of the things that we bear in mind is that a lot of the disputes that we see involving BRI disputes are between a Chinese party and an international party. So what the court takes into consideration when it comes to this is to find someone who has good access to both parties' time zones. So this is something that we simply do look at. And normally the arbitrator's place of precedence is something that will give us a, a hint as to whether he, will be, he or she will be suited for that case. Thank you, Hazel. Uh, Sarah, does it, how does the HKIC do it? I mean, what are the factors that you look for these days? Yeah, well, I think, you know, appointing arbitrators is really the most important function of any arbitral institution. And so when you're trying to suit particularly a sole or presiding arbitrator to a case, you look at all of the different factors in the case and you try to marry the right person to the case. And part of that traditionally was looking at where they're based and where it might be that they have to go for any hearings because that has cost implications, obviously. But that's changed in the pandemic because now what we're thinking about is rightly so in your question is time zones. So if we have, for example, an Asian party and an Asian tribunal member, based tribunal member and someone based in London, that you know that there's a good workable overlap, although it does mean that typically the Asian based person will be sitting in the evening. But if you have that already as an institution, we're going to be hesitant to put on someone based in New York because those time zones are very difficult to manage and you don't want to do that to a tribunal for a dispute that may last for years. You really 
we're thinking about the location of, of the tribunal members in a different way and trying to make the time zones compatible so they're workable. Thank you, Clara. Um, I think we'll now move um, over to the next topic, which is a very apt topic uh, today, um, the impact of international sanctions on BRI uh, arbitrations and enforcement of awards. Uh, so uh, international economic sanctions are politically motivated, the economic measures enacted by one state against other states uh, and the entities or individuals of the other states. Uh, it limits their economic interests and rights to do business with um, um, other individuals uh, who have um, uh, who emanate from states who have implemented sanctions. So over the last few days, uh, we have seen uh, massive sanctions being imposed uh, from dozens of countries um, against uh, Russia, uh, Russian entities and individuals uh, uh, over Ukraine. Um, and I think uh, this has a very important um, impact on arbitration. I recall some of the difficulties I faced myself um, when we had to seek an experienced chair uh, in a few large quantum arbitrations. And none of the leading arbitrators were nationals of the EU, UK, US, Canada, and other countries were able to sit in, in, in a number of primary related uh, disputes uh, because the, those nationals had to comply with sanctions law issued by their own countries um, uh, against Russia. So um, that caused uh, um, uh, uh, it limited the number of um, individuals that one could consider, and certain law firms would not be able to act uh, for um, certain entities uh, which are, are considered um, as sanctioned. So un unless uh, uh, one had a special permission or license uh, from that state issuing the sanction, uh, one would not be able to act as a uh, counsel or sit as arbitrator. That's what uh, is termed specially designated individuals uh, or SDNs. So um, uh, the same situation um, will happen uh, uh, for sanctions coming in from China. Um, and more so because BRI disputes will always have uh, at least the participation of at least one Chinese party, and they would also have to be cognizant of the sanctions imposed by the Chinese government on the 26th of March 2021 on um, numbers of uh, individuals in the UK and entities. So there are cases, there have been a number of cases where a Chinese party would uh, challenge an arbitrator. Uh, who is or used to be a member of Essex Court Chambers on the 26th of March, 2021. Um, so an article that was written by Professor uh, Steve Wall um, uh, in relation to the 26th March, 2021 sanction, or what he calls the 263 sanctions have been relied in a number of cases by Chinese parties uh, seeking to challenge arbitrators who used to be members of Essex Court Chambers, but have since left. Um, so I like to ask, first of all, I like to ask um, Fu Yong uh, for his views on how Chinese arbitration centers, such as the Beijing Arbitration Commission, uh, would deal with uh, a sanctioned person, and what is the prevailing view now um, on this issue? Uh, Fu Yong, please. Thank you, Colin. Uh, if uh, the disputing parties challenge uh, an arbitrator based on the reason that he is uh, the sanctioned uh, person, uh, I think we would uh, incline to confirm uh, uh, this because, as you mentioned, uh, you know, according to the sanction uh, imposed by Chinese government on the March uh, twenty six on two thousand twenty one, uh, and they say, it says, uh, as of today, the individual concerned in their in, in the immediate family members are prohibited from entering the mainland, Hong Kong in Macau, China. Their pro property in China will be frozen and the Chinese citizen in institutions will be prohibited from doing business with them. 
So the first thing is whether this arbitrator could, uh, if the hearing uh, venue is in China, whether they can enter into the mainland. This is the first thing. The second even is uh, how to define the doing business with them. So if we just look at the uh, Oxford Dictionary, the business uh, means trade activity of making, uh, buying, selling, or supplying goods or service for money. So we could say providing arbitration service is could be easy uh, uh, categorized into the doing business. So based on this sanction decrees, uh, it is uh, uh, legally effective in binding on Chinese citizens in companies in China. So uh, if uh, they fail to comply with these sanctions, they will uh, and they to uh, participate in such uh, uh, arbitration, they will be exposed to penalties by uh, Chinese government. And I think further, the law firm uh, can be sued for negligence by the client. So uh, uh, in, in, the, in addition, if the Chinese client has to pay penalties to the Chinese government for being in reach of uh, sanctions, the client can uh, seek a compensation for, from the law firm for its negligence in allowing the a sanctioned individual to participate in the procedure. So I think uh, based on this kind of reasons, we would uh, confirm uh, uh, the, the challenge. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Fu Yong. Um, Sarah, uh, as HKAC is in Greater China, uh, would you also uh, face uh, uh, the same um, issues? And uh, how would you deal with uh, sanctioned persons or persons who, who used to be members of S Export Chambers on the 26th of March, but are no longer there? And the challenges are made against them. How would you deal with it? Yeah, well, uh, this is an issue, of course, that HKIC looked into closely at the time that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs made the announcement in March 2021. And I have to say that at that time, there was no implementing legislation, but that came later in June 2021. And that legislation applies only to mainland China, uh, because uh, as between Hong Kong and mainland China, national laws, i.e. laws that apply in mainland China, do not automatically apply to Hong Kong. They have to be implemented through a process to apply to Hong Kong. And whether or not that will happen with the anti-foreign sanctions legislation is unclear. But turning directly to your point, so after the announcement, Colin, and before the uh, the legislation came into place, this had an impact on on a few of our cases. So, for example, we had one case where uh, there was no Chinese party involved, but the co-arbitrators had put forward a list of potential presiding arbitrator candidates, and on that list was someone who was still at Essex Court Chambers. In that case, the parties asked the party the uh, asked uh, sorry the parties asked the co-arbitrators to remove that person. In another case, uh, to which you alluded to, um, to which you alluded, uh, the co-arbitrators uh, um, proposed two names to the parties, and one of the names was a someone who had been at Essex Court Chambers at the date of the announcement from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The respondent in that case, which was a Chinese entity, objected to that person on the basis of the sanctions. And uh, also asked HKIC not to consider, because HKIC became the appointing authority in that case, not to consider on its list any candidates from Essex Court Chambers or anyone who had been at Essex Court Chambers in March 2021. Of course, we complied with that. Institutions are always conservative and are never going to introduce problems to the constitution of the tribunal. Now, whether or not the sanctions apply to someone who was at the cham at Chambers in March 2021, I do not think it, there is a conclusive, um, that's conclusive. There are views that the sanctions still apply, but based on our direct experience, in some cases, it seems that they may not apply to those who have left Chambers after the sanctions were issued. For example, we know of one former Essex Court Chamber member who has been appointed as arbitrator by Chinese entities in our cases, but also, and I think more importantly, uh, instructed as counsel by Chinese entities, uh, by a state-owned enterprise, no, no less, and was issued permission to enter mainland China uh, during the pandemic times, which in and of itself, for a foreigner to gain that kind of permission 
is rare and exceptional. So I don't think it's conclusive. I, I know that Lord Newberger gave a speech in Singapore just in October last year, questioning this and wondering whether or not if you'd step down from Essex Court Chambers, it may be that you aren't covered by the sanctions. But, you know, I think it is an issue and I think that lawyers have to think about it when they're considering who to appoint, um, but it, it, it's not black and white to my mind. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, Hazel, uh, would you like to share the ICC's experiences on this issue? Certainly, and happy to. The, the sanctions that were announced um, last year did create a lot of complications, as I think all the arbitral institutions have mentioned. And I think I can speak for the court to say that we do take all kinds of challenges very seriously. Um, the court takes all objections to nominees and all challenges to appointed arbitrators very seriously. And we look into each and every allegation to see whether it satisfies um, the Article 41 of our rules, 14 one of our rules, which says that uh, arbitrator can be replaced or removed for alleged lack of impartiality or independence or otherwise. Some of you may have guessed that the otherwise is actually a catch-all provision. Typically, this covers a situation where the arbitrator is unable to or has taken undue delay in the conduct of the arbitration. And even if there is an objection or a challenge based on sanctions, we will have to tie that back to the provision to see how the sanctions actually affected the arbitrator's ability to manage or conduct the arbitration. And more importantly, what are parties' views on this? If both parties agree that the arbitrator should be removed because of that, this is certainly an important consideration that the court took into account. But it is heartening to know that um, there was actually a recent judgment in the Shanghai Financial Court where there was a request not to recognize an award that was rendered by a member of the Access Court. And I think that the Shanghai Financial Court made a ruling to reject that request and eventually recognize the award. I think this is a good sign that the judiciary is making an active effort to maintain the arbitration friendliness of the, the country and jurisdiction. So we do see this as a, uh, something that's comforting at least. Thank you, Hazel. Uh, Fuyong, uh, do you have any other to, uh, any comments um, on the judgment or any other judgments that you've come across on this point in China? Uh, yes, uh, as Hazel uh, mentioned, uh, the China, the Shanghai uh, Financial Court uh, issued a, a ruling uh, in recognize the the enforcement uh, of SIAC award. And but uh, please be. Uh, 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 be advised that one of the main reason is that uh, the reason one of the main reason is that uh, on the time of the sanction uh, coming to force, the award has been issued. So what we don't know is if the award is issued after the the sanction coming to uh, force, uh, what the the view of Chinese court would take. And another perspective is. You know, uh, basically, China uh, Chinese court system is very pro arbitration. For the local uh, court, if they would like to enforce an arbitral award, they just enforce it. Uh, and if they would like to uh, refuse the recognition and enforcement, they have to support to the Supreme People's Court before uh, getting the approval from the Supreme People's Court. They cannot uh, uh, deny the enforcement. So this case, because the Shanghai uh, uh, Financial Court, it is basically uh, like the intermediate uh, level uh, in Chinese court system. They just enforce it. So we don't know uh, what's the, 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 the stance of Chinese Supreme People's Court. So I think uh, uh, we still need to wait another uh, cases. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. So it seems that we have to wait um, uh, for the verdict uh, uh, for the Supreme People's Court. Um, Stephen, um, if you were lead counsel um, in, the, in a case, uh, and uh, let's say in London, um, seated in London, um, and the same situation came up, uh, and you were perhaps acting for the claimant, and you needed to enforce an award either in Hong Kong or China, 
how would you deal with the scenario um, if the opposing party appointed a sanctioned person? Yeah, thanks, Colin. Look, uh, every case obviously um, will lead to strategic decisions being made on the particular facts of that case. But I think the starting point when sanctions are being considered, I mean, it's sometimes said that uh, sanctions uh, are a form of soft war. It's sort of a non-military way of exerting pressure um, on another nation. Um, but I think what we need to all bear in mind is that sanctions are not soft law, okay? Um, uh, when when enacted, they become the law of a nation. Uh, I think, I, I, don't, I don't want to um, guess at how courts may ultimately come to determine this issue when it comes to enforcement, but there is at least a strong argument that sanctions laws, almost by definition, would be matters of public policy for the state um, enacting the sanctions uh, in question, and that gives rise to obvious enforcement uh, issues. So when we're looking at, say, take for example, the, the sanctions that were against a body of people, including Essex Court Chambers. Um, what it catch, captures, as has been mentioned, is doing business. Uh, I, I, I think the better of the arguments is that uh, arbitrators or lead counsel, experts even, uh, engaged in providing arbitration services probably are doing business. I'd certainly rather, I think, take that argument than to oppose it. And so when you, when you bear in mind that these sanctions are serious and they're likely to catch the provision of arbitral services, you then need to look at what the consequences of the sanctions are. And they can be very serious. Um, violation of the sanctions can lead to fines. Uh, they may lead to imprisonment in serious cases. We need to look at the obligations on the individual concerned. Um, we need to look at whether or not that goes to the capacity of a nominated arbitrator to fulfill the role. We need to look also at, um, in many jurisdictions, there is a, a duty of a tribunal to produce an enforceable award. But even if there isn't a duty, at least insofar as institutions are concerned, there is surely, at a minimum, a commercial imperative to ensure that awards uh, are enforceable or at least to, to do as much as possible to remove potential obstacles to enforcement, just for the survival and the marketability of, of the various institutions. So all of that points to being very cautious in this area. And I think it's only right that institutions are conservative, as Sarah puts it, when it comes to making appointments. Certainly at the outset of a proceeding, why would any party uh, who either wishes to facilitate an arbitration and produce an enforceable award, such as an institution, or dare I say it, even the supervisory courts at, at the seat of the arbitration, um, why would they take any risks when it comes to the appointment of an arbitrator who, because of their being caught by sanctions, might lead to the award being unenforceable? And, and I can't help but I mean, I flinched a little bit when Fu Yong said that there's even the possibility of law firms of being sued for negligence in relation to permitting a partner, but I guess it need not just be a partner, it might be uh, any member of the law firm or any employee of the law firm, um, act in a manner that is in violation of the sanctions. Certainly as far as sanctions, the recent sanctions in connection, for example, with Russia are concerned, um, um, competent, prudent law firms should all be conducting risk assessments to see what their exposure is and taking um, prudent steps to minimize their exposure to liability for violation of sanctions. So now to, to your question, Colin, what do you do if, if you're lead counsel for claimant, uh, you're presumably um, hoping to prevail in the arbitration, um, and if you are looking to enforce 
at least in, in China, and you're dealing with the concern that um, uh, an arbitrator from Essex Court Chambers has been appointed in respect of whom there is a, a serious argument that that individual may be sanctioned, you obviously would want to avoid that situation. Now, um, in my experience, when I have had concerns with the opponent's nominee uh, for reasons that I think go to perhaps issue estoppel or some sort of conflict that the, the nominated arbitrator might not actually be aware of, but certainly this would apply in the context of sanctions, I would bring that in, at the first stage to the attention of the arbitrator in question and respectfully suggest that they consider withdrawing from the case. Um, and for the most part, that approach has succeeded. But we're dealing here with reputable arbitrators who are more interested in preserving their reputation and preserving the institution of arbitration uh, than fighting for an individual um, appointment in a case. Um, one cannot be sure that every arbitrator will see things in the same way. Some of them might, for their own reasons, regard it as a prestigious appointment and the, 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 the concern about their appointment to be frivolous, and they might try to cling on to the appointment. Now, if that were to happen, and were it to be an institutional arbitration, one would then look to the rules of the institution to see whether a, a challenge could be brought. And I dare say, certainly based on the feedback from our distinguished colleagues today, that the institution is likely to look upon such a challenge uh, favorably. Um, where, 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 where we're left with an arbitration that's 90% con concluded and it could lead to significant disruption, uh, maybe a different test would apply than the test that would apply out at the outcome of proceedings. Now, if all of that failed or if there wasn't an institution involved, I think one would need to look to the law of the seat and then to take a view as to whether a challenge to the local courts for the uh, removal of uh, an arbitrator would succeed. But you would want to consider all of those options. To do nothing knowing that um, enforcement of the award might be vulnerable to attack because you, 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 you sat by, you acquiesced in the, the nomination and continued role of an arbitrator whose role in the proceedings might lead to the award being um, unenforced, that, that would be a serious concern for any um, lead counsel for claimant. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, and conversely, if the, uh, the, the uh, claimant's uh, uh, counsel do not have the um, amount of experience which you do, and they do not have the knowledge um, that um, they may need to make an objection. Uh, conversely, lead counsel for the respondent could also slip in a sanctioned person, and everyone keeps quiet about it. And one and a half years later, um, let's say an award is, um, is issued, and whichever way it goes, uh, you then have an issue at a fight at a place at the courts of enforcement if, if it's China or Hong Kong. And the question is whether you can actually have acquiescence mm -hmm. against um, sanctions because sanctions are the laws of a state. But um, I see there are a few questions coming up. We'll deal with them later. So um, let's let's move on uh, Colin, for if now. You, if, you, if you don't yes. mind, I just might respond to that quickly. Um, I, I, I'm not ever going to advocate guerrilla tactics in arbitration, that's a separate uh, subject. But one can see that a, um, a respondent party um, uh, who fears enforcement in China might try to appoint someone that they know is uh, sanctioned uh, in the hope that it goes unnoticed or that inexperienced opposition counsel don't take the point or that the point doesn't occur to the institution if there is one. Uh, or to the tribunal. Um, and then the question might arise, well, is any objection to that, that arbitrator waived either by the act of the, the party making the appointment or um, depending on the relevant rules or law, they haven't, an objection hasn't been made within the required time. And 
I've, I've had to confront this point before. Speaking for myself, I, I don't think that a sanctions objection is something that is capable of being waived by any party. Um, an objection may not be taken in circumstances where it could be taken, but that doesn't mean that any vulnerability of the award to a challenge to enforcement is cured. Uh, that to me would fly in the face of the intention of the sanctions legislation. And I agree, um, Stephen, uh, with that position. Uh, but obviously only if the enforcement is sought in Hong Kong or China, but if the enforcement is sought in another New York Convention country, which does not recognize the sanctions, then that'll be quite interesting as well. Um, but let's uh, discuss this later at, uh, towards the end. Let's move on to the next topic. Uh, and so the pandemic has caused many infrastructure projects to be delayed, suspended, or even terminated. Um, and because most of the BRI disputes are infrastructure driven, uh, it'll be interesting to know, uh, to hear from our uh, arbitration centers um, head today, whether there has been a growing increase in the numbers of BRI arbitrations involving uh, claims for damages arising out of infrastructure uh, investments which have been affected by the pandemic. May I invite Fu Yong to share your views first? Thank you. Thank you, Colin. My answer is also yes. Uh, you know, uh, from the PSC's perspective, uh, the international case though over the last uh, three years uh, kept increasing. Uh, it is uh, 163 in 2019 and 215 in 2020 and 249 in uh, 2021. Uh, and with uh, uh, disputing parties coming from over uh, 54 uh, countries. And, and if you look at a little bit uh, broadly, I would say uh, uh, I, I could add two more uh, perspective. Uh, one is, you know, uh, uh, when we define the BRI uh, disputes, uh, with one party from uh, one is uh, from China, the other party from other countries who joined the uh, BRI initiative. Uh, so, uh, the according to the most recent statistics, China has signed over uh, two hundred collaboration agreement uh, with one hundred and forty eight countries in uh, thirty two international organizations. So that means if you look at broadly, uh, the, the cases could be categorized into the BRI dispute is increased, I think. Uh, the second perspective is I tried to interview one in-house counsel uh, from a big uh, uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese construction corporation. And this uh, general counsel uh, told me uh, they have uh, 600, uh, 688 87 ongoing projects located at 118 countries in and involving the contract amount 100 billion US dollars. In their statistics shows that uh, in on October 2020, 202 projects has experienced the temporary suspension and they tried, they raised uh, 56 claims for damage and only three was accepted and one was rejected, 15 uh, was only permitted to the extension of periods. And then uh, 37 did not respond. So deadly, most of the claims, may, we are uh, going to the disputes uh, before the, uh, the arbitration center, uh, maybe. Thank you. Thank you, Fu Yong. Uh, Sarah, do you see a similar increase in the numbers uh, uh, at HIAC? So um, it's, it's quite difficult to define what is a BRI dispute in the first place. Uh, so you need to put in, some pla in place some parameters that are meaningful because the Belt and Road uh, Initiative has uh, no discernible outer limits. Uh, when you look at the first jurisdictions that were deemed to be BRI jurisdictions, there was a limited number. And now, you know, we're, we're quite a few years in. It was launched in 2013 and, and it really does cover most areas of the world. 
Um, we did a survey on our cases from January 2016 to June 2020, so almost four years worth. And we were, our parameters were to look at cases that involved at least one party from mainland China and one party from, from one of the 145 BRI jurisdictions that were identified on the China official Belt and Road, Belt and Road portal, Yi Dai Yi Lu. Uh, and we identified 95 cases of that nature, um, but that's really just a fraction because many of the cases we see are offshore incorporated in the BVI or Cayman Islands with Chinese uh, controlling interests. Um, and also we don't account for the last 18 months. Um, there were a wide range of nationalities, 22 nationalities in addition to mainland China, uh, and a significant proportion of those cases involved SOEs, approximately 15%. Um, and the types of disputes were broad, maritime, a lot of trade, uh, a strong corporate side, uh, professional services, so your generic commercial contract, but embedded in a BRI context. Financing is very common, and construction and IP. Um, but, you know, the subject matter of the cases, it, it's varied, as you know, anyone would imagine, um, subsea cables in the Middle East, financing of oil exploration in Western Africa, drilling operations in Turkey, and an equity interest in, a, in an infrastructure in a special trade zone in a, in a developing Southeast Asian uh, country where um, in the contract, the investor is referred to as a BRI Chinese investor. Um, the uh, Hong Kong law was the most common law. English law was the second most common law. English was uh, the language in 70% of the cases, and then 18% were in Chinese only, and then the, the rest were in both. Um, and in terms of the nationalities of arbitrators, there were 19 different nationalities. Um, I would say that in terms of any trends we see at HKIAC, there's a lot of you know, strong um, amount of con contractual debt claims um, arising out of many different kinds of contracts. Um, but where we see growth is in the corporate dispute area. So that's that's very common in our cases around post m &A joint venture disputes. And there is inevitably a mainland Chinese element in those disputes. But I think the takeaway point is that when you're asking yourself, what is a BRI dispute? Um, there is no defined uh, BRI dispute. It can cover all kinds of commercial and investment activity because, of course, the projects are very large. Thank you, Sarah. So indeed, there are divergent views on what are BRI disputes, and, and rightly so. Um, Hazel, um, how would you uh, see the ICC's cases in Asia, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, with respect to uh, such disputes, uh, BRI disputes? Any well... trends? <laughs> Well, I mean, just looking at ICC cases generally across the board, um, I certainly echo the, the institution's difficulty in defining what is a BRI dispute because we don't um, group our statistics according to that. But from what I can see, China, I mean, taking the origins of parties uh, as a gauge because as uh, all of you have mentioned, and I think we agree, BRI dispute, one of the common feature is that one party does originate from China. And what I can see is that at least in the past three years, China, including Hong Kong, Macau, has been in the top 10 origins of parties consistently in the ICC arbitrations around the world. And in fact, in the preliminary statistics that was revealed earlier this year, China is one again, once again among the top 10 origins of parties. And I think that, if anything, is a good sign that BRI disputes are definitely among our cases forming a large proportion. Um, and I definitely echo what has already been said that the amount in disputes has also increased drastically. Uh, we see a sharp increase in the average amount of disputes in the preliminary 2021 statistics that was reviewed in January. And construction remains one of our top industries uh, being among the, the disputes that we see in, in ICC arbitration, which is a sign that a lot of our cases are coming from the BRI. Thank you, Hazel. Uh, so, Fuyong, perhaps later you can get you can prepare yourself 
uh, on one of the questions, which would involve statistics, um, where um, uh, the number of BRI cases uh, for domestic disputes involving one BRI contractor and the Chinese supplier. But if you don't have the information now, perhaps you can look for it um, later if, if you do have it. But my question to you now, Fu Yong, is um, um, in addition to infrastructure, uh, uh, project related and financing disputes, uh, do you see any other emerging uh, trends in the type of BRI disputes that have been coming up? Fu Yong? Uh, you're on mute, Fu Yong. Oh, um, I think you're on mute, Fu Yong. Now it's open. Ah, yes, we hear you now. Okay. So uh, I say uh, the new type of dispute is the IP disputes. Uh, you know, especially the licensing disputes. And what's inter interesting is in the past, usually it's for foreign party uh, to claim for the licensing fee from the Chinese party. And, but recently we find most cases are the Chinese parties claim uh, for the license fee uh, from the foreign parties. Thank you. Yeah. Ah, thank you, Fu Yong. Um, Sarah, what about HIC? Do you see any new uh, trends, new new types of BRI disputes coming up? Yeah, I would just say the trend is really in the corporate side of things. And I would also echo what Fu Yong just said. And it's a trend that we have seen at HKIC over the years and that mainland Chinese parties, which were traditionally the respondents in the cases, we see more and more our claimants. And in that subset of cases I just referred to that we define as BRI disputes, 42% of the claimants were from mainland China. So I think that that's a, you know, that's a really interesting indicator of, of the, I think the, the outbound activity of mainland Chinese entities uh, and the fact that they're running into some disputes and, and opting to arbitrate as opposed to negotiate or settle otherwise. And uh, Sarah, what, what about, um, uh, how, how would HIC uh, try to attract more arbitrations? Are there um, any, any new uh, toolkits or anything being developed? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, one of the most important products that an institution puts out is its rules and they have to be relevant and they have to work um, and so we revised our rules in 2018. We, we tend to revise in five year periods, um, you know, not to make too many changes so no one can keep up with them. Um, but I think what one of the most important changes that we introduced back in 2013 even was a set of provisions that uh, apply to multi contract, multi party situations. And we all know about you know, the constitution of arbitral tribunals with multi-party provisions. So it's, a, it's beyond that. It's with respect to whether or not you can start an, one arbitration invoking multiple contracts. We do not require identity of parties between the contracts. I think that's really important. And we also allow for um, the consolidation of arbitrations to occur both before and after the tribunal. Uh, and with respect to joinder, again, that is the case. We allow it before and after the tribunal is constituted. And we also introduced in 2018 a provision whereby if the case is not suitable for formal consolidation, if you have the same tribunal and you have common questions of fact or law, the cases can be run together. So, you know, and this is absolutely relevant to BRI disputes because we're talking usually about multi-party, multi-contract, high value disputes, uh, uh, a network of contracts that, that all belong to the same transaction or a series of related transactions. So you want the proceedings to be run by a qualified tribunal and the outcomes of the decisions will be compatible. Um, unless the parties don't want that, which of course they can opt out of in their clause and that's fine, we would respect that. Um, but I think that is a really important offering. And, and I think all of the institutions have some sort of, of that offering. Um, and then we have other practical tools that apply to BRI disputes, but also to any disputes, large and small. So, for example, last year, we launched HKIC Case Connect, which is an online case management platform. It's secure. Uh, you can 
host all of your documents there. It contains all of the case information. You can run your calendar on the case there and it links to Outlook. So it's really a, an important tool for say parties from jurisdictions where maybe they're having connectivity issues. It's that one place where you can go to for the whole case. Um, and that's been taken up quite well. We offer that free of charge um, at the moment. Um, and when I say at the moment, I don't mean that we're going to put in place very high fiends. I just, I just mean we want people to use it to see that it's useful and get used to it. And then the other thing that we've just recently launched is HKIC Case Digest, where we publish our decision making around some of those uh, provisions, the more complex provisions. If there's a contested consolidation, how do we decide it? And so that gives council uh, really a, a, a library of information about how we're making our decisions. And that's transparent and it makes things more predictable and uh, inevitably will avoid costs. And many thanks for sharing those progressive tools, uh, Sarah. Uh, so that's Greater China. What about China itself? Fu Yong, what's the BAC doing to make uh, yourself more attractive to BRI disputes? Actually, uh, most arbitration institutions are basically doing the same things, I say, I think. Uh, for BAC, uh, first we also to make the rules uh, very in line with international practice. So that the attorney with different background feel very comfortable to represent a case before BAC as they, they do before the tribunal at Hong Kong, Singapore, or London. And second, uh, we will try to involve more international arbitrators in BAC cases. Uh, for example, in uh, last year, 83 appointments goes to arbitrators without Chinese nationalities. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Fu Yong. Um, in view of the time, um, I will skip uh, to the uh, final topic first, and then we'll deal with the questions from the floor and then come back to the fourth topic if there's time. So the last topic, um, which uh, is a very important one, is diversity uh, in BRI arbitrations. So um, issues of uh, gender diversity in international arbitration was first raised in 2014. So uh, many um, helpful initiatives such as the pledge uh, have been undertaken by international arbitration centers across the world uh, to achieve the primary objective of promoting female practitioners for the sake of diversity in arbitration. So now uh, female diversity has been achieved uh, in many arbitration centers, uh, but uh, there's now a lack of focus on uh, geographical diversity. And I think this was uh, first uh, raised by uh, practitioners in Africa, uh, but it also uh, was raised by practitioners in Asia after that. And perhaps um, I can invite um, the uh, institutions to deal with this. Uh, so how would you deal with geographical diversity? So not nationality, because they can be nationals of any, any sort, but they, they may be based in different countries um, uh, across the Belt and Road countries, maybe Pakistan, maybe uh, Cambodia or uh, Hong Kong or, you know, um, so how, how, how do the institutions uh, deal with this? Sarah, how does HIC deal with this? Yeah, thanks, Colin. So I think, um, yeah, what we do is we have, well, we have a panel and a list of arbitrators from which we appoint. And that's really our starting point because it's a vetted list and panel. We're not restricted to it. And we do often go off it. It depends on the case. Um, we actively seek to identify qualified arbitrators from different jurisdictions. And one of the ways we do that, uh, I can tell you about what we were doing all of last year is recognizing that there is perhaps some webinar fatigue around the world. We, um, we ran out a, a program of uh, closed um, round table events and they were aimed at specific jurisdictions every time, many across Southeast Asia. And there we invited um, leading practitioners, but also other practitioners. And we brought them all together and had a, a session together where we, we presented on HKIC, we answered questions, and we basically got to know each other. And from those sessions, we then followed up with different one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one presentations with people who had um, attended those sessions. And part of the aim of that is to find the people that we don't have on our panel or our list yet. 
and to identify them and then to invite them to join so that they are there. And because this is a, a database, which is not just used by us, it's public. Uh, I know that different firms use it and I know other institutions sometimes use it. So it's, um, it's important to take that first step just to identify who's out there. And then um, I think it's also important in the institutions, and I think we all do this, is to actively uh, screen our processes for diversity across gender, across ethnicity, across background. Of course, you know, our first obligation is to appoint someone who is qualified for the case. And that, that is imperative. Um, and at the same time, we are looked to, to champion diversity across gender and, and all of these other um, uh, aspects, and that we do. Um, but I think there's, there's an important balance there. And there are also pipeline issues that we need to, you know, they exist. Um, so this is not something that changes overnight, it doesn't change in a year, it changes over five years, 10 years. Now at HKIAC, we, um, we, we are very actively trying to appoint first time arbitrators with a case uh, where that, that is fine for the case. Um, so that in five years time, that person will have five appointments under their belt, perhaps, and will be, you know, ready for the, for the bigger cases. But that's how you deal with, I think, as an institution. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Hazel, can I invite uh, your views uh, for the, uh, how the ICC deals with this topic, subject matter? Thanks, Colin. And I definitely echo what has already been said. I think this is not something that Diversity is not something that can be achieved overnight. And I, I wouldn't quite say that gender diversity has been achieved. I would say that it's an ongoing effort. And I think that we have seen marked improvement in gender diversity, but this more can always be done. But as you've rightly pointed out, diversity is not just limited to gender diversity. It also includes regional or geographical diversity that's been discussed, and also generational norms diversity that Sarah mentioned, appointing of young arbitrators. I think in, in 2016, the ICC court introduced a new policy to publish limited information relating to arbitrators who are sitting in ICC cases. One of the main driving intentions behind that really is to, that, to provide the information with the hope that this demonstrates the quality of the tribunal that are being appointed and also provide information and incentivize parties to think about regional or geographical uh, factors when it comes to think which arbitrator to appoint for the cases. Uh, this is one of the priorities for us and we are always working in this. We are also supported in, in our work when it comes to appointment by national committees around the world. Uh, most of you may know that ICC does not have a panel of arbitrators. So when it comes to appointment by the court, what we do is we rely on the local recommendations of our national committee that's situated in a particular jurisdiction. And depending on what the case or the dispute requires, we go to that particular national committee in that jurisdiction to recommend us someone who is suitable. And whenever the case is appropriate for a new arbitrator, someone who may not have arbitrator experience, we are always open and welcome and encourage national committees to give us new names who will be suitable. Because as Sarah says, we have to start grooming young arbitrators now so that years down the road, they become the arbitrators that we can rely on for bigger and more complex cases. In fact, 2020 actually marked a new record for ICC in terms of geographical diversity of arbitrators. The arbitrators that we confirmed in 2020 came from over 92 jurisdictions. This is the widest geographical representation we've recorded today. Um, some of the new nationalities we saw are from Afghanistan and Barbados. So this is something, something that, that we're committed to improving. More can always be done. Um, I think that it is good to know that all the institutions are paying focus and attention to this. Thank you, Hazel. Um, let's um, quickly uh, deal with some of the questions that have been raised. Um, so that, that there are a number of questions. Um, so I think the first question 
um, I'll ask um, Stephen to deal with. Um, so uh, it's from ah, Professor Steve Moore. So he, he talks about the massive increase in international trade uh, has propelled um, arbitration. And he, he's, he says that section is something that we're already familiar with. Um, and but he wants to hear your well, he wants to hear the views of, of um, some some impact on sanctions affecting arbitration. So I think earlier on uh, we were talking about the practical issues um, and um, you mentioned guerrilla tactics, etc. Do you want to expand on that, please? Well, I, I don't want to become the host boy for uh, guerrilla tactics and arbitration. <laughs> Um, I, will, I will say that um, sanctioning the then members of Essex Court Chambers um, was a, is a real problem and a real blow to international arbitration. Um, that particular set is comprised of many of the uh, leading um, arbitration council and arbitrators in the world, and very large numbers of them. Um, so it, it, it's a real problem because the sanctions do bite. And as I said earlier, they can lead to very serious consequences if they are violated, not just for the sanctioned individual, but for the integrity of any award that they might participate uh, in producing. Um, I, I don't advocate and I don't suggest that uh, parties are likely to involve sanctioned people in their arbitration. Um, but of course, we're dealing here not only with, with sanctioned individuals sitting as arbitrators, but doing business in relation to an arbitration. So that could be a role as counsel. It could be um, a role as an expert. Who knows? It might even provide the provision of advice behind the scenes, which is not apparent at the time of the arbitration. Who knows? Uh, but I do think, I do think it unlikely that we're going to see um, Chinese parties, and it would be Chinese parties who I guess would engage in this guerrilla tactic because they would be the party who are most likely to suffer from uh, a negative award that might lead to enforcement efforts in their territory. So they would be the ones who might think of putting in the poison pill of a sanctioned person somehow into the arbitration. Personally, I, I, I can't think of any reputable counsel who'd be representing such parties who would think that that was, was a good idea. Um, but one, one certainly can't uh, uh, rule it out. But look, I'm, 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 I'm grateful that Steve is on this call and I'm grateful that he has produced uh, his excellent um, paper on the subject and I commend it's reading to all of you. I think a link to it has been put into the into the chat. And I think once you read that, it, it kind of opens the mind to the various avenues for um, abuse um, um, by parties of the sanctions in order in some way to frustrate the proceedings or the outcome uh, of an award. Thank you. Uh, can I now invite um, Fu Yong? Uh, to deal with uh, Professor Susan Finder's question, uh, if you do have the statistics, uh, what is the number of BRI-related uh, domestic disputes, uh, and, and for example, between a BRI contractor and a Chinese uh, supplier? Are you able to tell us? We are uh, sorry, I don't have the exact uh, statistic on hand. But I, then, uh, uh, Susan, I know uh, Susan Finder very well. So if I have, I will share with her later. Yeah. Thank you. Right. I think um, we, we have, we have uh, run out of time. Um, and I believe uh, um, Andrew wishes to give a closing okay. speech now. So I think on behalf of all of these speakers, uh, I thank all of you for attending uh, today's session. And now over to you, um, Andrew. Thank you, Colin. Um, and thank you to all our panelists. So I'm, I'm sorry that we have to interrupt such a fascinating conversation, but um, uh, as Colin said, we, we do need to bring the session to an end. 
So thank you to, to Colin, to Stephen, Fiong, Sarah and Hazel for all of your insights and analysis today. Uh, and thank you to all of you who attended this webinar and for submitting your questions. Uh, a reminder that you can read the CDR Essential Intelligence book on Belt and Road, uh, on the Belt and Road Initiative uh, at iclg.com slash CDR, where you will also find day-to-day -day coverage of the international dispute resolution market. If you have feedback on this event or our coverage, do please feel free to get in touch. But for now, thank you all for your time and I wish you a good day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you and bye-bye.